Welcome to Sippin' with Sonny, How to Taste Wine Like a Pro. This is the third web chat hosted by the Web School Alumni Board and the Office of Alumni and Development. I'm Kristen Linton. I'm the Director of Leadership Annual Giving, and I am a graduate of the Class of 2000. And I am delighted to introduce my former Spanish student, Ryan Steele, Class of 2010, who will be guiding our taste buds today. Ryan is working towards his European Masters in Viticulture and Enology at the Montpellier Soup Agro in France and the Università di Udine in Italy. He's joined by a man who needs no introduction to the web community, a man of many talents and a connoisseur of many beverages, the legendary <laughs> historian of the web school, Mr. L.R. Smith. Um, thank you so much for joining us, gentlemen. Just a couple of housekeeping rules. Um, please stay muted until the question and answer portion or feel free to raise your little Zoom hand um, if you have a question and, and we'll, we'll get to you. You can also type your questions in the chat um, and my colleague Jonathan Hawkins and I will be monitoring those questions and make sure that you can have those answered. Also, we are having a bit of a weather situation here in Middle Tennessee. Um, it might have been whipped up by Sonny himself. <laughs> um, if we get cut off, we apologize and we will reschedule um, or we will record it and post the, the rest of the chat later. So with no further ado, thank you, LR and Ryan for being with us. Ryan, what, what, are, what are we tasting? What have you got for us? So first we wanted to start out with the sparkling so that we could give a toast to Madame. Uh, any sparkling you have is perfect, but for us, we are trying this Cremant Rosé, which is especially meaningful to me because at the base of this mountain is where I worked, and on the top, Madame took us on a field trip. So I wanted to toast to Madame. For me, none of this would be possible without her. So, cheers. Salut, Madame. Madame. Chin chin. Chin chin to Madame. I must say, you are a delightful looking group of young people. Uh, uh, it, it, it is lovely to see you. So uh, we won't go too much into the specifics on sparkling today. Um, we'll focus on the others, but uh, just so you know, with this specific wine, it's a Cremant. It's made in the same way as Champagne, but if it's not made in the Champagne region, you cannot call it Champagne. So in each region of France, they make their own Cremant. And this is a Cremant Rosé, you can see it has a bit of color to it. So we'll teach you all about this in a minute, but I'm going to tell you this is has a bit of toast and some yeast from the second fermentation with notes of cream and strawberry. That, that, that Ryan. Yes, sir. Listen, Abby, yeah, you're, you're a man apart. Yeah, I got to say that. <laughs> that, 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 that yeah. I, and, and I think it's wonderful that you're getting into this. And, and I will say, of, of any alum who's ever done anything, uh, yeah, yeah, since since leaving Web, you're the only person that I would invest money in. Uh, if, if, if you I, I want to remind you that this is but, being recorded. <laughs> this is being recorded, and it's the truth. But so, yeah, yeah, Caroline, I'm taking your inheritance and giving it to Ryan. But, um, but, um, the. How'd you get into this? Uh, what, what turned you on to uh, to enology and viticulture and all that good stuff? Well, so I grew up, uh, agriculture was a bit of a hobby, doing it with my grandfather. And I continued on through school, graduated from the web school and went to engineering school at University of Tennessee. And I knew I wanted an excuse to go back to France. And the more I learned about agriculture, the more I kept thinking about our trips we did in high school and how accessible it felt. Um, a, lot, a lot different than what you, the image you get here in the States of the big fantasy and uh, all the extra that we do in wineries. So I thought it'd be really interesting to go back and find a study abroad trip for this. So I did a summer program in Toulouse in the South and I was right about this one thing that it, way, it was way more accessible than I previously thought. So after I graduated from UT, I was applying to grad schools and these French schools don't require the GRE and they're a lot cheaper than American <laughs> master's programs. So I decided to hop on over there. I was encouraged by a lot of my university professors, but when I approached this 
it's really with the economics and agriculture background and I want it to make sense. And the longer I was there, uh, the more I saw that that was possible and that maybe even I can bring it home to Tennessee. So I do have a little bit of expertise, but also I think for the listeners, um, you can trust me because I was once like you with no background. If Some of you may have a background, but for those of you who don't, um, I was new to all of this. So I can maybe explain it to you in a way that um, makes more sense without all the gaudiness. Uh, no. Oh, and, and good. That well, that, that's what I need. Uh, you know, yeah, Madame and I went to France you know, for years and years. I mean, you know, we went by ourselves. We 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 took kids. I remember. I remember you and you and Garrett King and Chase Edcock that that sliding forward down the aisle of the bus as I was reading Alvin York's diary out in the Argonne Forest. And uh, yeah. Um, and great things, and, and you know, we always tried to go to uh, either a vineyard or a champagne cave, uh, yeah, and, and give the students uh, an, an idea of it. And uh, so, so, yeah, so I've I've been to a lot of those places and things like that. But I'm I'm rather like Frederick the Great's mule, uh, whom they said accompanied Frederick on all of his campaigns. And at the end of Frederick's uh, wars, that mule knew about as much about the art of warfare as he did at the beginning. And, uh, and I'm sort of like that. You know, I've been to all these places. I don't know nothing. So, uh, so, so, so you need to teach me about this. You know you like it. You just want to know why you like it. Uh, exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, I, yeah, I want to yeah, yeah. I, I want to graduate from just sucking down some plonk to uh, truly uh, appreciating the, uh, yeah, the, 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 the differences. So for that, we'll just start out with the very basics. Uh, Mr. Smith, you have your plate of grapes beside you. But everyone knows that wine is made from grapes, but I think it makes a difference even just to look at it and think about it. So this is a grape cluster. Now it's a table grape cluster, which is a bit different uh, the grapes are a little smaller usually. Actually, they're not as sweet as the wine grapes, but you have your red and your white. There are some varietals that actually have a color in the middle. And usually like everyone's had Pinot Grigio. Well, in French, it's Pinot Gris. And this gray color is how you describe kind of the reddish gray uh, pink color of those grapes. But so you have the grape. It takes around 110 to 120 days from the beginning of the growing cycle to harvest. So we have our white grape here. The middle, of course, is white. I don't know if a lot of people realize this, but on the red grape, the color all comes from the skin. And I peeled a red grape to show you. I don't know how visible it is, but see the inside of the red grapes for all but about two or three varietals are white. So after you harvest your grapes, you crush them or you can leave them whole cluster and you put them through a press sometimes but you have all the squished up grapes in the juice now since there's no color in the white grapes the wine will stay white in a bit we'll have the rosé and when you have the rosé you have the red grape but the skins stay with the juice for just a short period of time and that adds just a little bit of color while your true red wines are left with the skins for a much longer time. That's the basics on the wine grape. So we'll go ahead and open some other bottles. Just so everyone at home is aware, we are enjoying the sparkling wine to begin with, but Mr. Smith and I do have spittoons. So for the rest of the tasting, we will be, um, you know, doing things the right way. We're on camera. <laughs> So we have first this white wine. Now we're, I'm going to explain a bit about the closures as well, but for this it's a screw top. So all you have to do to open it is just to twist it. Now wh why a screw top? Well uh, screw tops actually preserve the wine even better. It allows no oxygen in compared to a cork. So for white wines and rosé wines, especially, you keep more your freshness. Additionally, uh, it can be a little cheaper 
all the corks for the most part come from this forest in Portugal. So you, everyone in the world is competing for the same high quality corks, but you can make these screw tops anywhere. So, so I'm not going to be a creep if I if they see me, uh, you know, getting a screw top uh, down at the Kroger. No, sir. Okay. And actually, sometimes uh, in terms of sustainability, there's a lot of people accepting more of these uh, alternate closures. Um, the cork is nice. It does allow a bit of oxygen, which some red nut wines will need. But for the most part, it's more of just an aesthetic. And I will admit that works for me as well when you hear that nice pop coming out of the bottle when the, the, the waiter has brought you in the wine and used the nice uh, corkscrew. So first, when you pour yourself a wine for tastings, yeah, the, your glass is to your right. It's Thank a medium-sized glass, Mr. Smith. You actually don't want to overpour your wine for a tasting. So just pour you a bit in there. Not even when the glass starts to get smaller again, stop. So just pour a bit in there. Now, why this glass? As well, it opposed doesn't to need... the larger or the flute or the... Honestly, you can drink it out of anything you would like, but uh, you don't need as much air to come into contact with the white wine or the rosé wine. So you can just kind of see if the wider glass, we have a big red glass um, that we'll use later, but the larger the surface area, the more air contact you have. So also it's best to have a stem. I know that it's easy to have a lot of the wine glasses without the stem, but usually at a restaurant, the waiter is serving you at the wine at the correct serving temperature. And if you have a cooler wine, like a white wine or rosé, you don't wanna warm that up with the heat from your hand. So before you twirl it or anything else, you have the wine. If you have something white under you, like the backside of that paper, you can turn it over and you just tip the glass to the side and hold it over. And you can kind of see the color a little bit better. Now you don't have to do this every time, but if you really wanna be professional and learn about uh, each individual wine you have, you're looking at this. And uh, there's not as much of what the French call the robe uh, on this because it's white, but you can see the color. When you tilt it back up, there's a little residue on the side of the glass. I'll explain this more later, um, but you put it to your nose and you take your first nose, you smell a bit, and there's certain aromas you're gonna smell here first that will be covered up after we've twirled it. So don't twirl it before you do your first nose. So first nose, and then you wanna twirl it, not too much. Uh, a tip I read online said, pretend you have a pencil with a rubber band on the end, and you're trying to just swirl that rubber band around the pencil. Now smell it again, and we call this the second nose. Now, do you have any particular fruit aromas that you're picking up here, Mr. Smith? Well, the first nose was fruitier than the second. That makes sense. They're also some of the most fragile aromas, and they're the, some of the first ones that will disappear with the CO2 and oxygen. Okay. So the older a wine gets, the less of that you will have. So we have to watch this in particular in the United States. Um, they know they can dump some different wine on us, but for a lot of white wines and rosé, you want to drink them young. So you still get to appreciate those nice fruity floral aromas. Ryan, so, can I yes. ask you a question? You're like yes. really shoving your nose in there. Yes, that's another reason you would like a bigger uh, glass. Okay, so like it's not rude to like shove your face in the glass. Uh, definitely not. It's not rude at all. And in fact, in other countries, I would say, I've spent most of my time in France. I'm not trying to be biased, but that's where my education comes from. I mean, they really have their nose in there. Each nostril can smell a little bit differently. So you can tilt the glass mm -hmm. and really, and you twirl it some more if you have to, and just really inhale all this. And whether you realize it or not, your mind logs this information and it will allow you to taste the wine uh, more fully when you taste it. But so we'll go ahead and taste it. Can, can you Mr. over Smith, twirl? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, if the wine's already, a red wine's been breathing for a long time, you don't necessarily want to keep twirling it over and over. But, um, you know, if you're really trying to smell it, it's just best to do that. Twirl it okay. and smell. And Mr. Smith, before you sip, go ahead and grab your spittoon. 
not every winery has these, but uh, you will see these sometimes. We're gonna take a sip. Now really swish it around, Mr. Smith. Oh, I had oh, the spit to oh, talk. Try that again. Really swish it in your mouth like it's Listerine. Maybe even after you take a sip, you kind of like suck air. Uh, think of uh, Hannibal Lecter being a creep talking about the fava beans. Just. And then you spit. Okay. And what am I looking for? I am. Um... It tasted sort of uh, grapefruity, maybe. Yes, exactly. You didn't cheat and look this up in advance. No, did you? no, no. That, yeah, so this particular wine we're drinking. Really? I got one Blanc. right? Yes, sir. This is from Dude. Chile. A lot of Sauvignon Blanc that's available is from New Zealand or France, United States, uh, Australia, different places. But the Chilean one is one of my favorites. Um, Sauvignon Blanc can have a bit of a vegetable aroma. In white wines, they describe it tasting like asparagus. But what I've found is that the Chilean wines have less of that. So there's a nice acidity. There's not too much sugar. Um, I think this one is about three grams per liter, which anything under four is considered a dry wine. But the best part is the Chilean people have the best trade deals and they have all of this tax-free exporting they do. So this bottle here, I don't have the price listed in front of me, but you can usually find it most anywhere for about seven to ten dollars. Even if I'm with people that prefer expensive wines, I still will pour this for them most of the time. I, I really do like the Chilean Sauvignon Blanc. Cool. So yes, yeah, so you have grapefruit. If it's a less ripe uh, wine grape, it might have more of a lime taste and more ripe could that be a bit like a white peach? Now notice you don't have any, you should maybe a hint of vanilla, but not anything like you think of spices or anything like that. White wine, you're not looking for those. That's something you're gonna get in reds and I'll explain that more later. Um, notice, oh, I forgot to tell you to do this. To your right, there should be a little white disc, uh, metallic disc. These are called no drips and you roll it up and you stick it in the top of your bottle. Ah. Now this at a winery is great if you are actually drinking the wine because they will definitely give you a good pour. It pours out very smoothly, but I've never spilt on a table using one of these. And you can of course, you can order these on the internet, but you can use this in more than just wine if you don't wanna make a mess. Let's see. So, we, like we mentioned, yeah. this storm may be from Sonny. Yeah. Uh, what did What did Sonny <laughs> think about alcohol? What would he think about us right now? Uh, that I I can feel a uh, that a certain vibration, seismic tremor, uh, coming from the direction of Hazel Cemetery. Uh, I believe that uh, that that Sonny's going about fifteen hundred RPMs right now. Uh, <laughs> That yes, Sawney uh, was raised a, a, a stone Methodist. Uh, uh, he uh, he promised his mother he'd never drink, and and in fact, um, I'm trying to think if there's anything in the schoolmaker that um, yeah that no I don't think so. Um, that he yeah he when when he was in Confederate service they. Uh, they made him a uh, first orderly sergeant uh, in his company in the 15th North Carolina. And, uh, and the first orderly sergeant's duty was to issue the, 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 the liquor ration uh, to the troops. Sonny refused to do it. Uh, that's one of his main jobs. He said, I'm not going to give anybody whiskey. And, uh, and, and so they, uh, and, and you know, rather than fire him, they promoted him. Uh, he was, uh, you know, he, he, he was greatly uh, admired for, uh, you know, for, for, for his strength of character. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, he, um, yeah, he, he, he didn't have much to do with alcohol. Yeah, yeah, and quite frankly, when he, uh, yeah, he, he and, uh, yeah, he and his, one of his most famous pupils, Ned Carmack, 
uh, yeah, he, he basically wouldn't let Ned come back to school uh, in the 1870s because Ned was such a mischief maker. But, uh, but later on, and, 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 and through his life, Ned Carmack sort of gigged Sawney every, every chance he got. Uh, but when, Karnak, when Carmack uh, you know, got into politics, uh, he, he, uh, was, was, he and Sawney agreed on the prohibition uh, issue. And so at, at, towards the end of uh, both their lives, they were, uh, you know, they, they, they were great friends and uh, political allies. And the thing that brought them together, in fact, was, uh, was prohibition. And uh, yeah, Ned Carmack got gunned down on the streets of Nashville for it. Uh, yeah, and uh, that Owen Sawney eulogized him. Uh, and, yeah, the rest of that. Uh, so, so yeah, Sawney, um, yeah, so, 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 Sawney didn't have much to do with alcohol. <laughs> but um, that on the other hand, I don't know, you know, Sawney only, to my knowledge, Sawney, Sawney only went to France once. I, um, that's when he took Son Will uh, over there to uh, do a do a tour of uh, England and France and uh, the rest of that, and they were they 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 were in Paris for the opening of uh, of the Eiffel Tower in 1889, and Madame always wanted to figure out was it the real opening, which was in the spring of 1889 at the Paris exhibition, or was it at the official opening, which was on uh, July 14th, uh, 1889, uh, Bastille Day, that was the official opening. So we, we, we never found that out. I've still got to look that up. Um, but the, 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 the only story that had to do with alcohol that came out of that trip was uh, apparently they were in Scotland and were at some Robbie Burns castle near uh, some some lake and it was raining and nasty in the Scottish Highlands and um, that and they all just got wet and chilled and they went into some crofter's hut and uh, and Sun Will was was apparently uh, that 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 close on to hypothermia and uh, and so the crofter you know, offered him the only thing he had which was a glass of scotch. And, uh, and, 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 and with Sawney's permission, uh, Sun Will sucked it down and, uh, and, and apparently <laughs> became, became quite voluble and, <laughs> and, and very happy fellow. And, uh, yeah, and, and it says Sawney and the preacher that were with him, <laughs> with, with him that was scandalized. <laughs> Wild. Is it is it true? Sandy Joe Pewitt asked um, that you know Webb was moved from Kalioka to. Oh, the oh yes, yes. Uh, you know that's only half true. I, I think in, in my in, in my humble opinion, uh, I think it's only half true. Uh, the yes, the uh, the legend that I got from the very first day was that uh, you know the 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 reason that Webb School moved from Kalioka to Bell Buckle was because Kalioka was wet and the, uh, the merchants of Kalioka were plying Sawney's boys with, uh, with that demon rum. And uh, Sawney, was, uh, Sawney and John were uh, publicly and vocally opposed to it, uh, which did not make them any friends in the community. Um, that and uh, that and and uh, apparently, uh, yeah. I mean, it, 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 yeah, it, it came to violence. Uh, you know, Sony, you know, the, the 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 locals would jump Sony, uh, or and or John, and uh, that and 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 the, the boys would have to, you know, run down from campus and uh, you know and, and and rescue Sony and John. <laughs> And you know, get beaten up by the locals, but but yeah, that was uh, you know that, a lot of that was over the liquor issue, and and when Kalioka uh, when Kalioka voted to incorporate, the uh, uh, apparently that that was that meant that the wets were in charge, and uh, that was one of the things I think that that uh, yeah uh, that 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 impelled Sony 
that and, and you know, to to leave. But but also, I think as as much anything else, uh, the uh, yeah, the, the apparently Sony said you know, there were there's very poor medical services in Kalioka. Uh, the local doctor apparently, who was a very popular fellow, Sony said was drunk. Uh, the guy did allow, he completely misdiagnosed uh, a student who was ill, and that student died, and Sawney was very vocally unhappy about that, and so, uh, you know, that, that created more bad blood, um, and, and Sawney's brother-in-law, Will Clary, was a doctor, he, he uh, that, that, that's Emma's brother, uh, he had uh, cured Sony of a tapeworm, apparently, and Sony thought that you know, saw, thought he was awfully good, and he was in Bell Buckle, that or near Bell Buckle, and so that to Sony, you know, Bell Buckle being dry, there being me better medical services in Bell Buckle, and also uh, Bell Buckle was on you know, uh, uh, you know a, a main railroad line, so um, yeah, so all of those things got to go in. And you know the the story is that you know, the the people in Kalioka didn't know a thing about it until one morning they w awoke to see this wagon train leaving uh, le leaving Kalioka with uh, with the boys sitting up on top of the wagons on top of the furniture reciting their Latin lessons going out of town, which is. I believe completely apocryphal. <laughs> they, they advertised that they were moving to Bell Buckle months in advance, <laughs> and uh, but but yeah. So 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 Sandy, you're exactly right. Uh, yeah, alcohol and Sonny's attitude had a lot uh, to do with the school coming to Bell Buckle. Well, you mentioned bad blood. I'll say we move on to the rosé, which one method of making it is actually called Sonye, meaning blood. So for your glass there you have, Mr. Smith, just uh -huh. dump it straight into your spittoon. Now, when you're tasting at a, at a nice cove or cave or a cellar or a vineyard, it's actually considered polite. You don't want to get drunk. You want to keep your senses alert. So even if they overpour you, it's not rude. If you dump it in here, they know you're serious about the tasting. It's not necessarily that you dislike the wine. So maybe even take a little splash of the water there beside you and rinse your glass out. And if you want, switch a little water and spit it as well. So for those of you at home, I would like you to also grab your red wine if you have it close. We're going to go ahead and open that up and let it breathe while we get through the rosé. Hey, Ryan. Ma'am. And Hannah Little has a question. Hannah, are you, I think you're unmuted. I asked you to unmute. Did you want to ask it now? Oh, okay. Sorry. No, I actually dropped my phone. Sorry. <laughs> but um, we do have a photo of, of Sonny in the archives with the Anti-Saloon League. And I just thought that might be of interest um, to great. the folks out there. That's all. Cool. Thank just a you. comment. That's awesome. I'll mute myself. Okay. <laughs> if we if we get a digital version of this, maybe we can post it in the event group. Afterwards. Oh yeah, that's a good idea. Sure. So if you have a red wine that's not a Beaujolais, I want you to get your corkscrew. Oh, if that's it has not a, a that is not a Beaujolais. Not a Beaujolais. Okay. So for you, Mr. Smith, that's the Barbara Dosti. Okay. So I've already opened this one, but you'll still use your corkscrew. For those of you at home. The polite way, supposedly, is to cut the foil. Now, if it's loose, you can pull it off. It won't bother me any, but you have it, and you're supposed to cut above this little lip. You can see it's a little bit wider there at the top, a little collar. You cut above the lip. You just twist your bottle around and cut your foil. It's nice to have a sharp knife. Mine's gotten a bit dull. I've probably opened a few too many bottles. So then you're gonna get your corkscrew. I prefer these if you're opening a lot of bottles. It's called a double hinged or a two-step corkscrew. Mr. Smith, oh, you do you have an old school or is this, what is this? I have, th I this, I have. This is a Nontron pocket knife. It's made by a French company 
the same French company which made the kitchen knife that the assassin Revayak stole from his landlady's kitchen and used to assassinate King Henry IV of France in 1610. Uh, well, there's and, nothing more French uh, than taking down the monarchy. So uh, that, that there you go. So if you have your double hinge corkscrew like me, you're first going to push the first, first step, open it halfway. You lift back up, you put the second step in, and then you have the nice pop. Now, if you have an extra glass, you can go ahead and pour it in the glass. Mr. Smith, you should have a particularly wide glass on your table. So you're going to go ahead and just pour some of the red wine in there. And this will allow the wine to breathe. And I'll explain this more later when I'm ready to taste. Now, if you're drinking a lot of red wines, you may want to get one of these. This is a decanter. So for myself, I'm actually going to go ahead and decant my wine. You don't have to decant the whole bottle. But as you see, and I mentioned earlier, the larger the surface area is, the more oxygen will come into contact with the wine. So I'm just setting this in the back and we'll deal with that later. You can set your red to the side if you need space. So now we're gonna go to our rosé. Mr. Smith and I are drinking a Cote de Rose rosé by a producer called Gérard Bertrand. Uh, Many people are familiar with this due to the elaborate bottle he bottles his wine in. The bottom of the bottle actually looks like a rose. Now, usually I would say don't be fooled, uh, fooled by, do you need some help? Hmm? For, uh, so it's a glass, it's a glass bottle cap uh, or a cork, which is a little bit harder to open, but they uh, like to advertise this as being more recyclable and also, I'll explain this more later, but the cork has a risk of releasing a chemical into the wine that can make it taste bad. Oh. So with these glass closures, you never have that problem. So you're just gonna pour a little bit in your glass like we did with the white. And this, uh, particular wine I like a lot. It comes from Landoc where I'm studying, but it's made with the grapes Grenache, Syrah, and Sanso. Same technique. Same First thing. nose, First swirl, nose. swirl, second nose. Correct. Now these rosés from the south of France are particularly uh, white. They like the color to be described as onion skin. And you can see this. So while everyone's tasting, I'm going to show you a little bit again about the grapes. Oh, hey, Ryan. That, okay, the, now this one, the first nose, I didn't smell anything. I thought I had the COVID. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 the second nose was much more fragrant. That could definitely, there's more oxygen. Uh, I would say, too, uh, it's hard in the States to find a... Uh, very fresh rosé. If you have the same bottles that we're drinking, it actually lists 2019. Mm -hmm. And in France, for the most part, they're not drinking a rosé that's not been made within the last year. So in 2021, about now, the 2020 rosé should be out. So all those, those first snows, floral aromas and fruit aromas, um, they may have lost that a little bit already. Yeah. Okay. Also, this is maybe a little bit of a hot wine. It's 14.2% alcohol, which is fairly high. Uh, naturally, fermentation usually stops at 15. Uh, so we're hitting that upper limit. And that heat, you can smell the ethanol a bit, I think mask some of those floral aromas. But you should get some like red fruit, maybe some strawberry. Um, it's almost like a, a watermelon candy in a way. Now I would say I don't love uh, I don't like sitting around and just coming up with these terms. Um, it's a bit goofy to me. Uh, you can find them listed online so you know what the common language is, but it is good 
for us to have a, a shared uh, set of terms for when we're describing these things. So you should drink wine with other people. I mean, you can drink it by yourself, but it's nice to be social with this. And it's nice to have a way to describe what you're sensing. So with the rosé, I will do this real quick. I showed you earlier the grapes. And earlier today, we do this when we're testing the grapes for different uh, chemical levels in the vineyard. But I just took some of the red grapes and squished them up in a bag. And they've been in the juice for about five hours. And already, you're starting to get this color from the skins. Now it's not nearly as red as a red wine would be at home. And my filter is not super fine. So you're gonna have some sediment in there. It will look a lot better than this normally, but for those of you who drink wine frequently already, this is kind of the color of what the pet nat or some of the natural wines are. But you see just in a few hours, the color that's already been released a bit from the skins. So you have that food in front of you, Mr. Smith. I think yes. rosé is a great time to mix some of that in. Ah, Rosé is one of the few things that the French, everywhere in France will drink, even if it's not from their region. And they love to picnic and charcuterie boards are a great example of those kind of foods. Uh, I think rosés like this pair well with our sausages, any kind of cured meat. Um, we do have some nice cheeses, uh, crackers, anything. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe you don't have it with a nice big steak, but other than that, I think mm -hmm. rosé is a pretty safe bet. Hey, Ryan. The yes. So I'm, I'm drinking out of a plastic cup. Um, does the glass matter? Because like the, you can sort of smell the plastic when I do the first and second nose. It, I don't think it smells the same as it would if it were in a glass. Is that true? I think, I think that's true. Um, it just maybe too in advance, you just pour a little bit of wine in there and clean it out. I mean, alcohol is a great solvent. Mm -hmm. So it might get rid of some of the aromas. Same way if you leave your glasses in the dishwasher too long, they might get a little musty smelling. Um, or you use too much soap and it's going to smell and taste like soap. So maybe in advance, if you're worried about that, just put a little wine in your glass and swirl it around to get rid of some of those uh, undesired tastes and smells. Now, it, it, actually, you're, you're, you're moving toward a, a, a major question that I have, and it was something of a bone of contention uh, between uh, Madame and, and myself, and I'm sure she was right on the thing um, that, okay, wine and food, uh, is, uh, I, I tend to, uh, you know, gobble like a field hand and, and eat like a hog. And, uh, that, and, and so usually, you know, <laughs> yeah, I like whatever on my plate so, 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 so much that I, yeah, hey, I'll, I'll just wolf it down and then, oh, here's this glass of wine. Oh, I'll suck that down too. Um, that how should you go about the ingesting? Madame always said, she said, you've got to slow down. Uh, you've got to take a bite of food, uh, take a sip of wine, let the food open up the wine or the wine open up the food and the rest of it, make polite conversation and then do it again. And again, and I never had the self-control to do that. Is, is, is that the correct way? I think so. Mm -hmm. um, especially learning in France, they definitely know to take their time. You're not in too big of a hurry. And they'll serve a lot of their meals and courses, which helps as well. Um, you know that you still got plenty of ways to go. So you can't just sit there and gulp down all the wine at once. Um, same with the food and not all not all wines uh, make the food better and vice versa. I would say too sometimes enjoy your steak, enjoy whatever you're eating and then take a minute to sip on the wine after or before even. And a lot of times when you go to tastings, you do not want to have your food with it either. If you if it's the first time you've had a wine and you really want to sense and observe the wine, just have it plain. And then you will get a sense for it and maybe you can decide what food goes well with it. But 
Um, you definitely want to take your time um, and savor it. The, what, what's the current thinking on pairings? You know, I always heard you put the red with you know red red wines with red meat, uh, white wines with 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 poultry and pork and seafood, uh, etc. Is that still pretty much the rule uh, over there, so. or? They're starting to buck some of the tr traditions, but um, first of all, with the rosé, I'll explain tannins more a bit in a minute, but they will make some expensive rosés in a barrel, so you can still have that with the steak. Um, personally, I'm a white wine drinker, uh, which helped that I was in Alsace, where they make great white wines. If you have a nice acidic white wine, sometimes you can have that with the steak, but for the most part, your white wines going with your seafood and your white meat. Rosé can be with pork, veal, uh, white meat. And then they like said your true red meat, your beef and all you're drinking with the red wine. Mm -hmm. but, and but the, champagne apparently is appropriate for any occasion. That is right. Champagne goes with everything. I think if you've not ever had a great pairing, uh, it's hard to understand. But for me, the first experience really came with fresh oysters and a great acidic white wine. And in France, they do that at Christmas a lot. You just get a giant plate of oysters. You sit there with some great acidic wine from the Loire Valley and that's your meal. Mm -hmm. And it really just does take the oysters to another level. Oh. Because before that, I never experienced that too much. Mm. Oysters, yum, <laughs> yum. So mm. I'm gonna say that we go ahead to the Beaujolais, which is a red wine that actually you can drink with most anything. Now you can just, again, dump out your rosé. Mm -hmm. You probably don't have to rinse it here if you don't want to, but I'm going to go mm -hmm. ahead and do that. I would, while you're doing that, I was always worried about ordering wine in a restaurant. And I remember on our honeymoon, we were in Reims and, um, and obviously Madame was doing the talk. You, you know, folks, that's why Madame loved to go to France with me because uh, it's the only place where she could do all the talking. And, and I kept my mouth shut. Uh, and uh, that, but uh, so, so, so we're in this restaurant and, and the waiter, you know, the waiter comes by and, 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 and you know, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, can I help you? And yeah, and I think I opened my mouth and the uh, and shut it very quickly. And Madame did the talking and Madame did the ordering and the rest of that. And the waiter's looking at Madame and the waiter's looking at me. And uh and so that yeah, it came to the choice of wine. And uh, I'm not even sure that that we chose or whether, uh, Madame, I think probably said something to, you know, what, 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 what does the chef suggest or, or what do you suggest? And he, so he brings out the wine and, um, and pours some in the glass and, and offers it to Madame. Uh, would Madame care to taste the wine? Which I think was, uh, yeah, was, was, was quite, the, uh, quite the slap. At, uh, at Monsieur and uh, yeah, Madame said, no, Monsieur will taste the wine. <laughs> uh, and I'm sort of sitting there going, yeah, yeah. What's that guy talking about? I, I need to go outside with him. Uh, and, uh, uh, but, uh, the, so, so yeah, so I, I, that simply added to my fear of ordering in, in, uh, uh, the, in a restaurant. If, if you don't know what kind of wine to order, what's the best thing to do? Well, you should usually trust the small A, but there are a lot of these cues and unwritten rules that I'm not the biggest fan of. And especially in the States, I think um, we're, we're a little worse about uh, making the customers feel uncomfortable. There's a lot to know. There's more to know than you could learn in five years, I'm sure. And a lot of people in Europe especially grew up with it and they've gathered that experience over time. And a lot of your sommeliers and your wine store uh, employees, they're tasting wines every single day. So it's really not reasonable to expect you as an average consumer to know everything. So you should be able to trust the sommelier 
say, this is what I'm thinking. Maybe I should try that with this meal. And he can say, okay, yes, if you would like, but may, can I suggest this to you? And usually you should go with it, in my opinion. But as you gain more experience, you learn that there's some wines you don't like. And there's some that, honestly, some of these people who drink a lot of wine are just really into some uh, niche things. So you can tell them no, but I would roll with it. One, one question. So Blake Kokenauer, one of my star Spanish pupils, Hola Ivan, uh, has a question about putting ice cubes in rosé. And I also oh. wonder, is that is that murder? Like, so... No, no, no. I so actually meant to okay. mention this. So uh, one great thing with the French, even though we have this uh, great impression of them with their wines, they really taught me that whatever you like, you like, and don't feel pressure from anybody else. And if you prefer ice cubes in your rosé, go for it, especially when it's hot in the South. And even in France, you know, they don't use so much ice. They will pour the rosé over ice and you can do the same with white wine. So honestly, if anyone ever judges you or gives you lip about it, just ask them when they were in the South of France the last time and say, you know what the locals do. So whatever, whatever you enjoy is great. I mean, there's some places in the world where they mix red wine and Coca-Cola. I don't know that I'm going to try that, but other than that, I say go for it, whatever you like. In, in the trenches, they would they would mix uh, that rough red wine they were issued with their coffee. Mm. <laughs> That's definitely a kick. Oh yeah, that get get you going in the morning. So with the Beaujolais here, we're drinking a Louis Jadot Beaujolais Village. So this is a great time to explain as well about the labels. Because um, so after you've ordered your wine, they're going to bring it to you. And they show it to you. And if no one's told you, it's a bit awkward. You're sitting there, okay, yes, yeah, pour it in the glass. You shake your head after you drink it. Before you even taste it, you want to make sure that the year on the bottle matches what you ordered because each vintage is different. And as the wine ages, it can become cheaper, more expensive. And if you're not careful, you order the 2019, which was $20, and they might bring you the 2017, which is $50. And it's really not a, appropriate to send a wine back after it's been opened because they gave you the chance to look at it. So you make sure you got everything right there and you're good to go. Um, I will say too, they're gonna, you're gonna start to smell it, right? They give you a little glass, like in this case, they ask Madame first, usually it would be you. And you smell it and you really don't know what to look for. So I'm gonna try to explain that. Now, if you have a cork in the wine, there's a chance of what they call cork taint. And a chemical is not always present in the corks, but it can be there. There's no great way of predicting it. And that can leach into the wine and make it smell like wet cardboard or basement or wet dog. So if you have any of those aromas, tell the waiter and send it back. And don't feel bad about this because the restaurant will not pay for the wine if it's flawed in this way. They send it back to the distributor or the producer and the restaurant gets their money back. And if you're really not sure, you can ask the sommelier or tell him, I think it might be corked and he can taste it as well. And even if you don't ask him to do it, he may do it and don't take it as a slight. Um, it's his job because they will be charging the distributor for it. He has to check and make sure that it actually is a tainted bottle. Now there's another yeast that we don't want in wine called Brettanomyces. And it's what gives maybe a farmhouse or a Belgian style ale its unique flavor. But in wine, it's a flaw. So if you open the bottle and smell it and you smell Band-Aid or even uh, a, rub, uh, a horse sweat, any of these uh, smells that maybe we're a little familiar with in Bedford County, <laughs> you don't want that in your wine. And some people are more sensitive to it than others. Um, so if you like it, go for it. If you don't taste it, you can drink it. But it, even if you think it's there, ask the waiter or sommelier and he'll check it for you. But send it back if, if that's the case. Don't don't think you're doing anybody any favor sitting there chugging down the wine. You're paying for it. You want to get the best experience you can. So are we putting this in the medium glass? Correct. 
So Beaujolais is a wine that comes from the southern part of Burgundy. Um, this is a great chance to explain the Appalachian system. I won't go into too much detail, but if you have this bottle, it will say under the word Beaujolais Village, Appalachian d'Origine Contrôle, and abbreviated that's AOC. In Italian wines, they have their own version. You may see DOC or DOCG, but in these regions, they have specific rules in what types of grapes, uh, how you ferment the wine, how many grapes you take off per vine. And if you're looking for wine from France, it's a great way to know you're, you're getting, it's gonna be consistent. They have very strict rules. So you know when you get a Beaujolais Village that says Appalachian d'Origine Contrôle under it, uh, you're, you're not gonna have any surprises. Now this can be a bit confusing for people, but you can have a wine of France, and I'll use an example maybe of uh, behavioral rules in the United States and work down. But as it gets smaller, each region can have more specific rules. So in this behavioral example, there's ways we're supposed to behave in the United States. There's extra rules maybe in Tennessee. The Web School has a whole another set of rules that are even more specific. And you know, when you step into Mr. LR's history classroom, there's a whole nother set of rules in that little electronic square classroom. communication device in the basket now. <laughs> Pull up your tie, button your collar. So the same way in France, usually they would not make a smaller region or appellation unless you had more specific rules or a higher quality. So you'll see like a appellation, instead of the word d'origine, which means origin, you'll see the place, the origin, Burgundy, Contrôle, or you'll see Appalachian Beaujolais Contrôle, or an individual village. Um, I'll share some links after the talk to explain this better, but just know it may not always say Burgundy. It may say some little village, and it may not tell you what the grape is, but you know if you're getting that village, that place, you're getting a specific grape. You're getting a specific quality of wine. Mm -hmm. but, uh, didn't it start with the champagne? Uh, that, that uh, other sparkling wines were you know, calling themselves champagne and, and it was the, uh, uh, the, the, the calves in, champ in, in, in Champagne that, that, that were the first to say, wait a minute, uh, you know, we're gonna do an AOC. That's correct. In, in some places in California, they're still able to call it champagne just because they've done it for so long. But the champagne wanted to, the producers in France wanted to get control of that again. Mm -hmm. because they had a certain quality standard. Yeah. And this is not just for uh, wines. They've used this for all kinds of food products. You probably see this now where not everything is called Parmesan anymore. If it's something other than uh, a cheese made in Parma, you can't say with that uh, designated uh, origin that it's Parmesan. But it's just a way to make sure that the quality is there and those farmers and those regions aren't getting left behind. Right. And what, closer to home in, in the whiskey industry, it's, it's, I, I understand that when Prohibition ended, let Lim Motlow uh, down in Lynchburg, uh, you know, went to, went to the FDA and, uh, you know, uh, yeah, registered Jack Daniels, uh, old number seven is bourbon. And, and, and the FDA said no. So you can't register it as bourbon. And he says, why not? We've always said it was bourbon. And they, they said, no, uh, bourbon, we have specific rules for bourbon now. Yeah, as being a 50 plus percent uh, you know, corn the, in the mash and uh, you know, charred white oak barrels. And it has to go directly from the still to the barrel. Uh, and you're running yours through charcoal. You're using the Lincoln County method. And because you're running it through charcoal, it ain't bourbon. And, uh, and Lim Motlow, rather than being crushed, I said, you mean this isn't bourbon? You mean it's something truly unique? <laughs> There's lots of bourbons out there. There's one Tennessee sour mash whiskey. That, and uh, it's a major advertising uh, that uh, uh, ploy on Lim Motlow's part, and it worked. It's, it's exactly the same way. There's rules about percentages, type of grape, how much you pressure it. It's all, it's all uh, 
very specific. But uh, there are some people who are bucking the trends a bit. And in the, uh, in the states, of course, there's not as many of these rules. So it may not say champagne on it, but you can find some amazing sparklings here. And, uh, you know, really using that entrepreneurial spirit that we have in the States to, to capitalize, just like uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Motlow did. Mm -hmm. So we're getting a bit close on time. So I'm going to go ahead and push this on to the last wine, the red. Now, for all these wines I've chosen, I picked a lot of very approachable wines. Um, our palates are a bit different, especially in the South than in some other places. So I, and we eat a lot of food. So I want to find everything that's pretty agreeable with food. This last wine is not a wine that's also great with food. It's a Barbara Dosti. It's made from the Barbara grape, and it comes from the northwest of Italy. Okay, Ryan, why did the this have to be decanted and the Beaujolais did not? Really, the Barbara doesn't have to be. Uh, usually, it's a pretty fresh wine, but it is a 2015. So I decided to let it breathe a bit. Um, so there's this thing called tannin in the grapes. And that comes from the skin, the seed, and the stem. And it helps preserve the wine, um, just like tanning hides, similar word. And those tannins can be pretty harsh. It's what, when you drink a wine that makes your mouth feel all dry, that's what it is. And it actually precipitates out proteins. And the protein is what makes your saliva slippery. So these tannins are antioxidants. So by letting it breathe, it actually it essentially burns up some of the tannins, uh, freshens it up a bit, and the wines can be a little more approachable. And usually as well, when these are released, um, you're going to be able to sense some of the other aromas a bit more. If you do it on the front end, it just may not be as enjoyable. But you have more of a, a full, uh, comfortable mouthfeel. But especially any uh, Bordeaux blends, any California wines, 30 minutes to an hour. Some wines they even suggest to, to let breathe for four hours in advance. And if you're paying a lot for a bottle, you wanna enjoy it uh, as at the its best possible point. So these, these red glasses like this are nice because there's a lot more room to swirl and you don't wanna over pour because then you can't swirl it without making a mess all over yourself. Now in this particular bottle, I may actually be smelling a bit, a bit of volatile acidity, maybe a little like nail polish. This happens a bit when the wine's a little bit old, so that's another fault. Mm -hmm. So that's a bit of a risk. Not every wine, this is a great example, that not every wine is meant to save forever. 90% of the wines need to be consumed in three to five years. And we don't have time today and to go into what it takes to predict what wine is good, but there are reviews on most every widely available wine on the internet, and they will tell you this is the year to drink it. It's, it'll tell you if it's starting to go down. But three to five years max for most bottles. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that's, that's, that's a little long in the tooth. I think so. And you can see a bit of the change in color as it oxidizes. It goes from a deeper red to almost like a little bit of an orange hue, a little bit of a rust color sometimes. And again, you can hold it over the white paper to see that a bit. What's the year on it, Ryan? This one is a 2015. Okay. And if you it, have the same wine, and these have different years, so you have to watch out for this, just like yeah. in the restaurant. But if you have the same bottle as me, there's this tag on the neck. The Italians tend to put it more on the neck that mm -hmm. says DOCG, and that's the highest quality standard. Now, this wine's a bit old, but it's another thing to look out for, are these symbols. Well, thank you so much for teaching us all of these things. I'm, I think we, we have exhausted our, our hour, but I know that you have said that you will make your email available to anyone who has questions. Um, so Jonathan, if you could put that in the chat, that would be really helpful. It's ryan.steel at gmail.com. And um, I thank you so much for making this so accessible to us because 
you know, wine should be enjoyed by all and you shouldn't feel intimidated in a restaurant or, you know, when you travel abroad, when we can travel abroad. <laughs> so, um, but thank you so much for, for sharing with us. And, you know, we're as, as one, uh, one foot to another, I'm so proud of you. Thank you for, you know, for coming here and good luck with the rest of your studies. And I know that you're pursuing your languages and Madame would be so proud of you. LR, thank you for, for your stories and, <laughs> you know, playing the, the, the funny man to the straight man. <laughs> well, well, Kristen, this, this has been more fun than a barrel of monkeys. Uh, and I tell you what, Ryan, good job. And like I said, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna spend some of Caroline's inheritance on you when you start your, uh, your vineyard. The, Caroline, you're looking good, girl. Caroline uh, got a haircut. I tell you what, you got a haircut. You, that, 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 good luck, good luck. But I'll tell you what, oh, this is like a trip down memory lane seeing you guys. Thank you for coming, coming along. Uh, oh it's gosh, been wonderful so to see you. All of Come you. visit. Yes, yeah, thank you all for attending. Time. I hope we can do a wine tasting in person. I mean, this was very logistically challenging. We could not have done this without Raymond Pryor or Reed Brown or the support of the alumni board and the support of the alumni development office. So thank you so much everyone for, for this. Please email Ryan your questions. He's very yes. accessible. I have a lot of suggestions. Uh, there's a book that I use to give to everyone, Wine, wine Folly. There's a lot of podcasts that I can share with you. Um, even if you have a specific food pairing question, send it to me and I'll point you in the right direction. Like Kristen said, everything should be accessible, should be something we can all enjoy. And I will be very glad to do wine tasting events at reunion if people would like, Yay. even in some individual classes, but I will not be home permanently until at least 2023. <laughs> so just plan on that. Otherwise, uh, I'll give directions from afar. Well, thank you so much. And also thank you to Kelly Northrup for helping put the charcuterie boards together. She did a great job. Yum, yum. It was enjoyable, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. Good thing is the, the production staff is going to consume all of this in about five minutes. Exactly. <laughs> um, we are going to post this online on our Vimeo and our YouTube pages. So if you missed anything or if you came in late or if you want to share with anyone, it will be available to you. Uh, this is our third web chat. We're going to be doing web chats throughout the year. Our next month's um, web chat will be at the end of April, featuring local author June Hall McCash, who will be discussing her book, Eleanor's Daughters, a novel of Marie de Champagne, which is the 2019 winner of the Chaucer Award for Medieval Literature. So that will be be great to, to join. So follow our social media and for, for the dates and we'll, we'll be doing more of these web chats to come. But thank you so much, LR. Thank you, Ryan. Um, and next time in person, in person wine tasting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Definitely. And to the, any board members watching, please do not move the school if I put my vineyard in Bell Buckle. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much. Y'all have a great evening. And Sonny, you know, he, he backed off. We didn't <laughs> have the storm. Yeah, he saw all this was for educational the, purposes. The sun has come out. The sun has come out. Okay, so Sonny must be happy. Okay. <laughs> Bye, y'all. Thank you. Abiento. Abiento. Adios. <laughs>